Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolish of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For considering your calling, brothers, many, have, many of you uh, were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, as that no human be being might possess in the presence of God. But because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteous and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. Now Pastor Lee will lead us in worship. The title of the worship is The Wisdom and Power of God. I don't know if, uh, if I was the only one standing, but I, I, I stood for the whole thing, which is uh, nice in some sense, because a lot of Presbyterian worship, we tend to stand and then sit and stand and sit. It's like a exercise. Uh, I don't know if you've been in any of those rides at Disney, Rise of the Resistance or something, uh, but that line is a long line. Uh, and uh, some of these lines, in Disney, one of the things they do well is they let, they, they put some benches and stuff like that here and there and rise of the resistance being a modern ride they put a lot of benches a lot of stone type of things that fit the setting of the of the ride and um, so every time we would sit and I remember uh, within about five seconds you got to stand up because the line's moving again uh, and, and sometimes I feel like Presbyterian worship can be like that, right? Where you sit and you stand, sit and stand. But today, we, we, we just stood for the whole thing. I'm like, all right. Uh, you're joining me. I'm, I'm standing for this. We, yeah, that, that's how it used to be, right? They, they used to stand. They didn't have chairs. Uh, so everyone stood for the whole message. Uh, well, today, as we look at our passage, I was reminded of a story in the Bible when a pastor visited our home. He asked, he asked my, me and my sister, uh, as we were young children at the time, what is your favorite story in the Bible? And I remember telling him that my favorite story was the story of David and Goliath. Of David, how he wins that battle and he uh, defeats Goliath. He cuts off his head and he holds it up. And I'm like, that's a gory story in the Bible. And I like that. And that, that's a story of God's victory and, and so on. And God's people rejoicing and so on. And really, when, we, when, when I was little, I misunderstood the story and thought of myself as a little bit like David. I wasn't. I was shy. I was quiet. I was fearful and uh, didn't want to stand out or stick out or anything like that. But I always thought, maybe hopefully I might be like that David character one day and maybe there's that inner courage and I'll be able to stand up and do the thing, great things that David did. And the reality is that uh, as I grew up and as I understood the meaning of that passage more and more, I realized, you know what, I'm not like David. I'm actually more like the Israelite soldiers. I'm more cowardly. 
I'm more hiding in the background. I don't want to be picked for representing the people of God like David. And really, Jesus is the one that is like David. David is the type of Christ. Jesus is the one who is the ultimate one who wins that victory. And David defeating Goliath is kind of picturing for us that victory that Jesus Christ has over the cross, uh, um, over his death. And so the, the point of that passage is not that David is great and you can be like David. But the point of that passage is, is that really ultimately David points us to Jesus and we need to look to Jesus just as the Israelites look to David uh, and we're to look to Jesus for our victory. David is not an experienced combat veteran. Rather, he's a small shepherd boy. And God uses a small shepherd boy to deliver victory to the Israelites. Why does God use someone like David? We're told in the passage of, of 1 Samuel 17, in that story of David, that David is smaller than Saul because he doesn't fit in his clothing, his armor. He tries to put on his armor, but it doesn't, doesn't quite fit him. Why does God use someone who is like that? Non, in verse 17, we, we, we see here uh, in the verse just before our passage, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. In other words, God is using David, and God uses me, and God uses people like you, because not because of your greatness, but rather in spite of your lack of it at times. It's the lack of human power and the lack of human ability. And despite that, we see God's greatness. Maybe because of that, we see God's greatness. Right? Because if it were, oh, that David's that wonderful, awesome guy, and we always look to him, or Mike is that awesome guy, or Daniel is that awesome guy, and we always look to him, or Pastor Gunn, or whoever it may be, and, and you look to that person all the time, and then maybe we start thinking that person is our salvation and not Christ. Remember, science, when I was growing up, science was always touted as kind of the master. Science. Science says, science says alcohol is good for you, so you can have one or two. Don't drink too much. Science says too much is bad for you. But then sometimes they, they give the opposite and say, well, this, it's, the, it's bad for you. Science, when we came to COVID, gave us similar confusion, and more, more of us are familiar with that in recent years. Masks are good for you because they're going to prevent you from getting someone else's germs, and you won't get this awful thing called COVID. And then they're like, oh, well, no, masks are bad for you because you can't breathe. And if you can't breathe, that's going to be the end of you in the first place. Right? And so masks are good for you, masks are bad for you. It's all the science. Everyone said it's the science. And it seems like we have all this wisdom in the world. And the world tells us this is right, that's right, and sometimes it conflicts with each other. And as we live in this world a little bit longer and longer, as I've gotten older and older and more and more decades have been added to my years, I found that there are a lot of conflicting things the world tells you. And sometimes we feel like, as we grow older, like we are more mature, we feel wiser perhaps. Even our planning, our scheduling, our, our thinking about retirement or our thinking about whatever future stuff, we feel like we have more things under our control. Maybe even our, in our spiritual life, maybe we feel that as well. But if your dependence becomes something where you depend on that wisdom that you think you have, and it's not on God or the things of God, then you're foolish. If it's not focused on the cross of Christ, it's not, if it's not focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then it's really foolishness. So in verse 18, 
We're told, for the cross, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it is foolishness or folly, or it is the power of God. That's the message of the cross. And as a pastor, that's our primary message to God's people and to the people of the world, is the message of the cross. It's not about making you feel good. It's not about all these other things. It's about the message of the cross. The message of the cross is foolishness to some. It is the power of God to others. To whom is it foolishness? It is foolishness to those who are perishing. Because those who are perishing, in other words, people who don't recognize what Jesus did for them, don't recognize the sin that is in our life, that we have no way to save ourselves except by the blood of Jesus Christ. To those, this is just one man dying at the hand of the state. It's capital punishment. Whether he was rightly convicted or wrongly convicted, whether he actually committed the crime that he's accused of or not, that's secondary, but it's just some guy dying at the hand of the state in capital punishment. It's a meaningless death, even if it's a historical death. Why would anyone die for anyone else by the wisdom of the world that makes no sense? If you committed the crime, you're the one that pays for the crime. That's the wisdom of the world. More often than not, even with family members, it, it's, uh, we, we think twice before we would take the place of a loved one. But for those who are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God. For you and me, if we are hearing the message of the cross, I hope that it is the power of God for you. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we're told, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. In other words, it's not based on the eloquence of the one giving you the message. It is the actual, the, the gospel itself, the, the, the words of the gospel are what saves. It doesn't matter if the person giving it to you says it well, says it funny, says it in a way that it, it connects to, to you somehow. It doesn't matter. It's the Holy Spirit working in you with those words. There's a story of a little girl. She was wearing a shiny cross around her neck. And a man comes up to the girl and says, Little girl, don't you know the cross that Jesus died on wasn't a beautiful thing like you have around your neck? It was an ugly wooden thing full of splinters and, and all that. And the girl said, Yes, I know. But they told me in Sunday school that whatever Jesus touches, he changes. And if you believe the message of the cross, you believe in this power of God's change. The message of the cross is salvation. Salvation for one who is a sinner. Because you recognize that you're a dirty, rotten sinner. But because of the message of the cross, you recognize that God changes you. It's victorious life despite different circumstances that seem to show a different story. It's life change that is... More, that turns you more and more into the image of Christ. It's life change that gives you no more guilt or burden of sin. It gives you no more power of sin in your life because now you have the ability to say no to sin. Before you had the message of the cross, when there was temptation, when your buddy said, let's go and grab a drink, and you know that whenever you grab a drink, you become a drunk monster or whatever, Maybe you're not even a drunk monster. Maybe, maybe you just become a, a, a happy drunk. Right? I, I did Uber driving for a while, and I remember seeing so many drunk people. <laughs> I never met so many drunk people in my life because I didn't hang around drinkers because I don't drink. And, and, and so when I, when I saw all these drunk people, I'm thinking, wow, a lot of people are happy drunks. They're not bad to be around. And then I met a few really angry drunks. I'm like, yeah, that's not pleasant to be around these angry drunks. Wow. Okay. But 
when you are without the message of the cross, without the power of God for change and salvation, when you're without that, you don't have the ability to say no to that temptation. Someone says, let's go, and you're like, yeah, but I'm just, yeah, okay. And maybe you might fight it for a bit, but you can't say no. And every time you fall. But once you're saved, you have the ability to say no. You have the ability to start afresh and to start anew. And so the message of the cross for those who don't know Jesus is foolishness. It it's, doesn't make any sense because it doesn't make sense by the way of the world, the wisdom of the world. But for those who are saved, it is the power of God. Secondly, in verse 25, we notice that God is bigger, better, and better. Verse 25 says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Long time ago, there was a, a drug ad. I forget which company it was, which drug it was. I think it was maybe Cadwit or something like that. And they said, we can send a man to a moon, but we still fall to the plaque that is building up in our arteries. I don't remember the exact wording, but something like that. So some sort of cholesterol drug. And, and, and the idea being that we can do all these great things, but we still can't, we, we still fall, we still die, we still get hurt. And that's so true, isn't it, as we look at our life. If you've ever stubbed your toe on something that's in the hallway, uh, as Asians, we, we tend to walk around barefoot in the house, and, and my toe has found things that I've lost for many years. I'm like, that's where that thing is, right? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, you, you find all these little things. But we, we, when, we look at, when we look at the things of, of God, we have to remember that God is bigger, better, and better. When you're looking at a parent-child relationship, who who is the weaker of the two, the parent or the child? Well, the weakest part of the parent is stronger than the strength, greatest strength that the child may have in whatever category you would put, whether it's intelligence or, or, or knowledge or you know, physical strength. Uh, for a young child, that would always, almost always be the case. I remember in one congregation I was serving, there was a young mother with young children. And she was doing high five, up high, down low, too slow, right, doing that whole thing. Uh, and, and I remember that she would usually let them eventually hit her as she kept on repeating that. And the kid wants to keep trying. And maybe some of you have done this with your parents where you just keep on trying, and you know that it's going to be too high. You know it's coming, too, and you still, you're, you're jumping up, and as high as you jump, you'll never reach, except the mom at some point will say, hit it too slow, slowly enough that you can actually hit it, right? And so we, we are able to hit our parent's hand and give a high five if they let us. And that's kind of how it is with our relationship with God. You can't touch God, you can't spit on God, you can't slap God, you can't mock God, you can't crucify God, except that he lets you. As a child, slapping his father can only slap his father if he sits on his father's lap. When it comes to salvation, I don't know about you, but I, I would have looked for a different way. But God, in his wisdom, in his infinite wisdom, says this is the only way. There's no other way. Blood has to be shed because there is sin. Sin requires the shedding of blood. And if we shed your blood, you're going to die. And so the only other way is I'm going to have to send you a different representative, one who is perfect. Because all of you are dirty, rotten sinners. So you can't represent humanity. But here is one who does, and that is Jesus. And so he sends to us Jesus in his infinite wisdom. But he says Jesus has to die because there has to be the shedding of blood for the payment of sin. 
In other words, justice would not be served if God just says, you know what, sin is there, but ah, forget about it. I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice God. Just forget about it. God can't do that because then he's not a just God. If there's sin, sin has to be paid for. And the only way was through Jesus. And so God in his infinite wisdom does it this way. In verse 19, we read, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Now the context of that is Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, 14 is what he's quoting. And the context of that Isaiah 29 passage, and that's, that's uh, one of my favorite passages, actually, because uh, in Isaiah 29, several times we see the name Ariel. That's the name of our daughter, one of our daughters. And Ariel is, in Isaiah 29, a substitute name, a nickname for Jerusalem. And um, nice name. Uh, it means Lion of God. And so when we told my parents, I remember my, my mom saying, hey, yeah, that's a good name. And I referred her to a couple places in, in the Bible where Ariel comes out. Not the Little Mermaid, okay? Yeah. And so she, she looked at that and like, yeah, yeah, okay, good, good. Biblical name. And then she read, Woe to Ariel in, in Isaiah 29. She's like, I don't know about that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's not, not a good uh, way to approach that name. Uh, but when you understand the context of Isaiah 29, it makes a lot of sense in the way that God relates to us. It is exactly the, the theology that we have in the Bible, right? Which is that Ariel, Jerusalem, is worthy of judgment. Woe to Ariel, woe to Jerusalem. The people of God, people of God have failed again. Judah has been seeking an alliance with Egypt with the looming Assyrian threat, right? If you remember from your political science class, you may remember that, that idea of detente, right? You have a bunch of countries that they, they're smaller and they can't quite measure up militarily to the great power of that day. And what do they do? They, they kind of gang up and say, well, you know, if you hit one of us, we're going to all hit you back. And so the greater power is kind of contained. Right? And so you have this kind of system going on. And we see that very often it may work for a time. It really just seems to delay the inevitable. And so you end up with a bigger conflict in the end because World War I and World War II were a result of that. But unless God is in it, it, it will fail and they will be defeated. And so we see ultimately in Isaiah 29, that it is God who does, delivers God's people. It is not the Egyptians, it's not the foreign powers, but it is God himself. God delivers Ariel. And so I pointed that out later to my mom, and she said, okay, okay, all right, sounds, sounds like a good name. We'll go with it. You know, Dad is okay with it, Mom's okay with it, all right, we'll go with it. Uh, and so God's wisdom and power for salvation for all the things we do and think and, and the way we interact with the world is important because God is bigger, better, and better. That baby girl, Ariel, our daughter, when she was first, uh, when we were pregnant with her before she was born, my wife, we, we were of an older age, and so the doctor said, well, you uh, should go see the special, I forget what the name was, but the, you, you, got, you guys, high risk, high risk, I believe was the term. You, you got to go see the high risk doctor because you're, you're, the mom is older, right? And I think if you're over 30, you're considered old. I mean, we weren't super old, but you're old, she, he said. So higher risk for the kid. Uh, and so we, we went and saw a doctor. He's a, a guy from Harvard and all that. And so my wife was like, all right, all right. We found a good doctor. Let, let's go with this doctor. And the doctor comes back one day looking at the ultrasound and the images and says, okay, you know what? This kid, hmm, this fetus has a head size of a certain head si uh, si measurement. And the arms and legs, the ratio, hmm, doesn't quite work out. The arms and legs seem a bit short. And so 
I wonder if this baby might have Down syndrome. Hmm. And so the doctor suggests that we should try this thing called amniocentesis, where they stick that big needle into the fluid and draw some out. And he said, that will be conclusive. Then we'll know for sure, 100%, whether or not this child has trisomy 21, Down syndrome, right? But there's a 2% chance that the child may die, the fetus may die in this process of amniocentesis. The blood work sounded like it was okay, the baby should be fine, but uh, the measurements didn't seem to work out according to the doctor. And so I tried to encourage my wife. My wife was distraught upon he hearing this news, and I, I tried to encourage her. And I said, you know what, maybe it's the, that Asian thing. You know, we got that short daddy, right, short legs and short arms, right? Maybe we've got that thing going on. And then I reminded my wife, hey, remember when you were getting your wedding uh, Korean outfit thing for our wedding? Uh, when, you, when you made the order to Korea, she, she, made the, she made the measurements, she sent it to Korea, and they shipped it over or something, but they, they left the arms longer than her measurements because they, they're like, no, 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 that, that, that's too short. That's not, that's not possible. There must be a mismeasurement. They can always cut it, but they can't add it on later. So we're going to cut it long. So they sent it long for my wife because even for Korean measurement, apparently my wife has short arms, short limbs, I guess. Uh, and, and so, and, and so I, I tried to encourage her, and, and I joked with her. You know, as, as long as it's a, it's a, not a boy, and he's not getting into a lot of fights. You know, it's a girl, so it should be okay, right? Boys, you want to have the long arms because you know, the longer reach and all that when you're fighting and, and so on. But it's a girl. A girl's not going to get into a physical fight. Nah. It's, so I wasn't worried. Not too much, anyway. Well, it turns out that the child was born later. We, we decided, by the way, not to do it, not to go through with the amniocentesis because... Our, our commitment was that even if the child has Down syndrome, what, what then? Are we going to abort the child? We're not going to abort the child because of Down syndrome. We're not going to abort the child, period. But for Down, definitely not, right? So I, we decided, you know what? I, I, I told, we told the doctor, we're not going to do it. And he kept on pushing it. And this is the Harvard guy. And you know what? He was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. It was the Asian thing. <laughs> The child was born, Ariel, she is, we, we didn't give her any special whatever, and, and she's acing her classes and all that, and definitely anything far from, far from Down syndrome. She doesn't have Down syndrome, right? All the Harvard knowledge that we have, all the wisdom of the world, nothing compared to the wisdom of God. Imagine 2% chance. That means if, we, if there were 50 of us, one of our kids would have died. Right, if we, had, if we had this process 50 times. I mean, bright kid, who knows, could discover the cure for something down the road or figure out how to live on Mars or, you know, whatever, something significant for the world, perhaps, being knocked out early because the wisdom of the world says so. God is bigger, better, and better. For the Jews, they were looking for a miraculous sign. They even got a whole bunch of miraculous signs. And they still didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. The Greeks, the Gentiles, they were looking for wisdom. right? They had that whole goddess of wisdom thing, Athena. They looked respectfully to their philosophers, Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. Many in that day and age depended on the walled cities. How thick are the walls? How grand are the walls? These things will save us. What is the strength of our military? How many chariots do we have? I mean, that was the measure of strength of that day. And we think we're bigger, better, and better because of these things. But really, God is the one who is bigger, better, and better. Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. I mean, this, they look at the, the things of God and it doesn't make sense to the world. So the message of the cross is foolishness or the power of God. And God is bigger, better, and better. And, as, and finally, in verse 28, we see that God chose the things that are not to nullify the things that are. 
So what are the things that are not? The things that are not are the things that are lowly, the things that are despised, the things that are uncool, the, the underdog. And God uses those things, those people that seem to not amount to much, to nullify and shame the things that are. Jump back to that story that I started with, David and Goliath. Remember David? Remember how Saul reflected on who David is? You're just a shepherd boy. Goliath has been fighting for his whole life. He, he's trained in all the military arts. How are you going to defeat him? And the guy doesn't even bring a sword and a shield. He brings stones and a sling. And that's it. And Goliath is armored. How is he going to defeat the enemy? And God uses someone like that to nullify the things that are. King Saul being the king, he's the one that should have been the representative of God's people. And when the uncircumcised Philistine is defying the armies of the living God, it should have been King Saul who said, I will stand for the people of God. But it wasn't him. Because he wasn't depending on God. And it was David who recognized that God had delivered him from the hand of the bear and the, and the lion. That David would say, God has been faithful all these years. God has delivered me all these years. God is with me, and I, I know that, I feel that, I've been there. And because of that, I'm going to trust that God will be with me even in this case. But I'm not going to stand by and watch this uncircumcised Philistine ridicule the armies of the living God. I will represent us. Do you remember how shameful it was for King Saul afterwards? God took the things that are not to nullify the things that are. And the people were shouting that King Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Christianity is often the quickest, quickest growing among the impoverished and disenfranchised peoples of the world. And I think part of that is because of this idea that Christianity has, that it takes those things that are not, and God uses those things that are not, those things that aren't that great according to the eyes of the world and God uses those things in great ways and Paul tells us plainly why in verse 29 so that no one may boast before him you're saved because of who Jesus is he's the perfect God man you're saved because of what Jesus has done because he died on the cross because he was resurrected from the dead you have no boast before God in other words you can't say that I am saved because I'm somewhat better than the other guy. No Christian can ever say that because that's not the truth. In Judges 7, we see the story of Gideon as well. And in the story of Gideon, he starts off with 32,000 men. God says, no, nah, too many, 10,000. Still too many, down to 300. Right? And he whittles it down to 300. The other army is like a whole order of magnitude big, bigger than the original army that the Israelites had. And so the army that God ends up allowing Gideon to have, about 1% of his original army, is an even smaller fraction of the enemy army. And why does God do that? A lot of times we get confused with the story of the 300 Spartans and think, well, you know, they're military genius and militarily they're awesome people and they're the best of the best. And so God took the cream of the crop. And, you know, there's some question on that. Because when you look at their leader, he was more of a coward and he was a sinful person. And the Bible's clear on that. That's the part of the story that we often don't see. But when we understand who Gideon is, that's who he is. He's not some great, awesome leader who has all these military accomplishments and stuff under his belt. He's a nobody. He's a sinner, a dirty, rotten sinner, a bad leader. And God chooses to use him. He wants to not be the leader. 
And God chooses to use him anyway. That's the story of Gideon. That's who God uses. And what does he do? He brings about a great defeat of the enemy. It wasn't, in other words, it wasn't because the size of the army being so awesome that they can match up by their own strength. It's so that they can remove all doubt. God says, you know, 1%, less than 1% of your army. That's what we're going to use. In 2 Kings 19, the threat of Sennacherib uh, and the Assyrian military, we see God's deliverance there, where 185,000 dead Assyrian troops are found overnight. The defenders of Jerusalem, they didn't fire a single shot. God delivered God's people. And so why does God do this? In verse 31, if there's going to be boasting, then boast in the Lord. He's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. If your congregation becomes a great congregation, maybe in size, maybe in accomplishment, maybe in its influence in the community, in however you measure that greatness, if it ever does anything great, I hope that your boast is not in your numbers or your ability or your whatever. But I hope that it's in the greatness of our God, that you boast not in yourself ever, individually or as a group, but that you boast, that your boast would always be in the Lord. Let's pray.